because uh, to get him off the stage and allow me to get up, I'm actually surprised I've got up before 12 o'clock. I said to Joanna, I'll only need a sermon from 10 past 12 to about 20 past 12 because the pastor, whilst he'll give me the opportunity, it will be brief. So uh, I thank you for the actually keeping quiet and getting off as quick as you could there. <laughs> Amen. Oh, he's left already. Pray, pray against that offense that has entered his heart. Amen. I'm excited because I know what God's going to talk about this morning. And I know it's a nice thing for a pastor to say, and I know it's a nice thing for someone to say that I pray that it's none of me and it's all of God. But if you know me behind the scenes, I may be vocal up here. I may get on as if I'm all relaxed and I, I can talk and I'm not. But if you meet me on one to one, you realize that's actually a very quiet person. He doesn't know what to say. He won't look at me in the eye. That man's awful timid. And why am I saying that? Because I generally believe that it's all of him and none of me. If I could get out of the way and that God could appear here and speak, I would much rather that. And I'm not offended for you to say, Neil, we'd much rather have that as well. It's all about him. And I'm going to speak with you this morning. I can feel his presence already. I'm going to speak to you this morning about things that are very, very personal to me. Now, that may not have meant anything to you, but I know I have got my family's attention. Because in my family, I like to call myself, well, look at myself like the Godfather. If there's a problem, I'm going to come and fix it. If you touch my family, you will see that I am not Mr. Quiet. You come against them, I'm going to come after you. Now, I know this is not a good thing for a pastor to say, but come on. I'm going to be real with you this morning. Because God put it, that's, that's my family, amen? I'm called, I obviously I respect my parents and they're, they're the head of the home. But God's put something inside of my heart, a passion for my brothers, my sisters, my parents, that I will always look after them. And I'll always ask them, how are you and what's going on? And if they're sad, I'll send them a text occasionally. I sent them a sister, the Lord spoke to me in the middle of work. I started crying and working. God, God, I'm in work, could you not do this? But I'm sending her messages about that she's in the hands of God. But a funny thing is this. That when my family come and say, Neil, how's it going on with you? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all within me. I am well, I am blessed. Brother, I am living in faith. And things may not be going tickety-boo, but I will not let them know what's going on. Why? Because I've got to be the strong one, and I won't say what's going on. And yet God's been speaking to my heart in such a personal way that I know, and I am 100% convinced that this church this year will not be the same church that it was in 2016. I am convinced that when God begins to move, he first of all comes to the pastors and the leaders in the church, and he begins to give them a shake, and he begins to waken up their hearts, and he begins to stir inside of them. And when he slapped them about as he's been doing with me, when he's got them to a place, then he begins to move in a church. I want to share with you what God's been doing inside of my life because I am convinced there is not a person in here that God is not going to talk. He is going to talk to every single person. He is going to walk into each and every one of your lives this year. I, don't, I am 100% convinced you may never have felt his presence before. You may have looked and saw, well, I've seen what's happening in the pastor and I've seen what's happened in their life, but that never happens to me. I can promise you, I have heard the Father and I know what is going to happen this year. And inside of me, I've seen what is going to happen. It is bigger than you can think. It is bigger than I can think. And I don't even believe that God has shown me everything because if he showed me everything, I couldn't cope with it because faith is bigger than we are. If you get a dream from God and you think you can do it, baby, you didn't get to see all the dream. You cannot do everything that God asked you to do because you need him. And God is going to do marvelous things this year. And God began to stir my heart, and he began to call me in the midnight hour. He began to call me again. But before we get to that place, I need to know you, let you know the place that I was at. I'm not talking this morning about sin in our lives. 
I'm not talking about being away from God. I'm not talking about being backslidden in our hearts. But I'm talking about being a place where you weren't as close to God as you should be. That's a big thing for a preacher to stand up and begin to talk in the midst of the service. But I, although I'm the pastor, I am not the one I want you to serve. I want you to serve Jesus. And if I am over myself, I got over myself a long time ago. If I wanted you to serve me, I would tell you all the good things. But I want you to let you know that God is a God in the good times as much as he is a God in the bad times. He's a good God when you're smiling and he's a good God when you're frowning. He's a good God when you're in health and he's a good God when you're in sickness. It doesn't matter the situations or the circumstances. He is still a great God. Amen. Amen. Now I need to get to what I'm going to say or it won't be short. So turn with me. You're going to know this, this story. But turn with me this morning in Luke chapter 15 and verse 11. This is the parable of the prodigal son. We all know it, but I want to make sure we set the context before we get into this. And it says here in Luke 15 and verse 11, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and he took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he'd spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country and he began to be in need. And so he went out and he hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise, I'll go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And he arose. And he came, or I missed it. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hard servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But while he was still a long off, his father saw him. He felt compassion and he ran and embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and the shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. We've heard this parable. You would have, I didn't need to read that this morning. You would have known the story of the prodigal son. And many times we've heard that preached as if you were lost, you'd never given your life to him, that the Father God has made it access to you to surrender your life and come to him. It's not my point this morning, but it's great to know about salvation. Amen. It's great to know that we don't have to be dead in our sins, but we can come to the Father. And I encourage you this year, I give you that challenge as well, the same as the challenge to me, that let this year be a year where you lead at least one person to Jesus. You may have gone in 2016 and not led someone to the Lord, but don't let 2017 pass without bringing someone to know who he is. Amen. It will also hear an application of this where it talks that you're backslidden in your heart. You've gone so far away from God that we're living in sin and that we should come back to him. That's also a good story. That's also right and something that we should do. If we're living in sin and we've missed the mark, repent, the time is short, and come back to him. But that is not the purpose of this morning. I am not speaking to you as if you are lost. I'm not speaking to you as if you are backslidden in your heart, because I don't believe that's the place we are in. But I am speaking to you this morning something much more intimate and something much more personal. I'm speaking to you about your relationship with the Father God. I'm talking to you not about Christianity or religion. I'm talking about you knowing the Father God intimately and personally. 
Where I got to in my life was this. If you go back several years ago, everyone's going to know what I'm about to say. But my brother and his wife, they give birth to twins. And in that moment, it was, you know, it, it was all things weren't good. And um, young Zach, he lived. And Zach today, praise God, he is a miracle child. The doctors can't believe what's going on. He's not supposed to be able to talk half the way he can. He's not supposed to be mobile the way he is. He's not supposed to recognize colors and shapes the way he is. And he is passing all of those tests with flying colors. That is a miracle. And every day we celebrate and call him the wee champ and, and a God star. And that is a miracle. But little Ollie didn't make it. And little Ollie died. And I don't know what it's about me, but God put such a passion and a, a compassionate heart inside of me, which is unusual for an accountant, I know. But it put it inside of me, especially for little kids and for little babies. And I don't know whether it was because I grew up with a family with eight kids. I didn't want eight kids too was enough. I wanted to help kids, but leave them at night time and let them get on with their own. But such a compassion. And there wasn't one person in our family who was affected by that. Each and every one of us was affected. And I'm not saying I was affected more. I wasn't affected more than anybody else. But it came in and it wasn't like a little slap in the face. It devastated and it broke my heart. Such was the revelation I have of God's love. Such is I revelation I have that God is and still is the healer. But it wasn't like a small slap. It was like I slid down on the tracks and not just one train, but about a hundred trains just came and rolled over me. And for a time I was angry on God. For a time I was confused. And after that, God began to work in my heart. And I cried out to him and I repented for the thoughts that I had. I repented for the actions that I didn't trust him. I repented and I got everything sorted out. But I give, let me give you an understanding of this. It was like that me and God, before that, we lived in the house together. John 15, it talks about it. If any man loves me, we will come and we'll make his home. It was as if before that I lived in the house with God. We had daily fellowship. But then the thing happened. Something happened in my life. And I decided, I don't want to walk away from God. I don't want to forget about everything that's happening. I don't want to backslide. I don't want to go into sin. I don't want to give this all up. But I'm not quite sure I want to live in the house. And so it's like I opened in my spirit. It's like I opened the front door and I took my tent and I stayed in the front garden. I was still close to God. I still prayed to him. I still read my Bible. I still came to church. I still preached the gospel. I still talked to people about God. I still loved God. But he was in the house and I was in the garden. Not backslidden in my heart, not living in sin, but not in the place where God called me to be. And for two years, for two years I lived in that place. I have to say, I have a wonderful wife. Now, you know, I'm saying this was like a nice dinner today when I get home. But I've got a wonderful wife. And she kept on saying to me, you're not the same person. Well, we'll not get on with how that conversation went on in the house. But you're not the same person. And, think, and I know she was talking to me in love. But I'm fine. And you sort yourself out and don't, you know, speck and plank in my eye and plank in your eye. Let's get you sorted out first. And so there I lived in that place. And I knew the Father God was talking to me, but I chose, God, I know you're talking to me, but I'm just happy enough in the garden. I'm happy enough just to be close enough that I can see you, close enough that I can feel you, close enough that you're still in my life, but I'm a little bit afraid to believe this again because I might get hurt. I'm a little bit afraid to walk back into the house. I feel just safe, just here, just in the garden. I know we need you. I know we've got to be close, but this is close enough. There's many people aren't even in the garden. There are many people who are in a far country like the prodigal son was. At least I was still in the garden. But God didn't call me and he doesn't call you to live in the garden. He calls us to live in the house with him in the place called home. And then one day I'm sitting there. How many knows that God doesn't have to talk to you and give you a big revelation. He doesn't have to sit down and explain everything to you. He came and he spoke two words. 
Two simple words that I didn't have to think, I wonder when this started. I wonder when this went on. I wonder what God means. I need to go to the pastor and can he interpret this dream? Can he explain this all to me? The father said two words to me and in that moment I knew what he meant. And the two words were, come home. Come home. And inside my heart, I knew exactly what he meant. I saw the pain and when it happened inside my heart, when I made the decision to walk into the garden and step away, I knew that I was still having a good life. I had a good wife. I was still getting promoted in work. Business is going good. Things were fine in my life, but I wasn't at home. And he said two words to me that he's saying to you and to this church as well. Come home. What is the thing that's taken you into the garden? For me, it was the death of a child, or the, my brother's child. It was death. But what is it the thing that's taken you away from the presence of God and you've decided to make your home in the garden? Did sickness come and attack your body and you've decided, I'll stay here? Is it, did you get healed, but you live in fear that the sickness will come back? Did your business go? Did your marriage end? Did somebody walk out of your life? Does your kids go in a torment? Are you disappointed that your ministry is not going the way you thought it would be? What is the thing that happened in your life that you have made the decision to step away, not completely from God, but just to put a little bit of distance? The Father God is calling me, come home. And if he's speaking that to me, there's not a person in here that he's not saying that to as well. He's speaking to every single person this morning and he's saying to you, come home. Let me be honest to you. I tried to figure it out by myself. I tried to work it all out. I tried to sort it all out myself. Let me save you the hassle and let me save you the heartache and the pain. There's only so far you will get in your own strength. There's only so far you will get by trying to heal yourself. But when you come home to daddy, in his presence there is strength and there is healing and there is joy forevermore. Amen. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. He is calling you home. I didn't hear an audible voice. I didn't hear like the heavens opened and God said, come home. But it was loud inside of me. Because I believe for a while he was whispering in the still small voice, come home, come home, come home. But I was choosing to ignore until one day he shouted inside me, come home. And it was so loud inside of me that I did look around to see, did someone actually say that? Did someone say that? And then I knew, Lord, it was you. Daddy, it was you. Did you really mean it? And he said again, come home. And here we see the prodigal son. He's sitting with the pigs and he's away. He's ruined his life with riotous living. That's not where we're at. But he comes to himself and he decides, I need to go back to my father's house. I need to go back to him again. And he says, no, I... I've wasted my life and I've sinned against daddy and this is going to be embarrassing to go back to the house. And I, I mean, I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll negotiate with daddy. I'll, what I'll say to daddy is I'm no longer worthy to be a son. Now I want to come home. I want to be in the house with you, but I'm not worthy to be a son. So could I just be in the house and a servant's enough? Just accept me back as a servant and I'll come back. And he picks himself up. It says he arose and he takes himself towards the father's house again. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I read it slowly. Because I love to picture and imagine what's going on. And I began to see an image in my eye when I was reading this. When, he said, when father said to me, come home, I immediately thought of the prodigal son. And I was reading it again and I could imagine it. And there I could see the son. He was, he's going to walk back to daddy. Do you think he got up off the pig pen and he sprinted towards the house? He's embarrassed about what his actions. He's wondering what will daddy do. It would have been right for daddy to go, you has been, you look at I've seen you, I told you if you did that, look what go on. That's what I would have done if I was the father. But no, uh, the father's going to forgive him. But there he is nervous about what the father will do. And so I imagine he's walking slowly towards the house. I don't know how long the journey was, but for the sake of a nice story, let's say it was a two-day journey. 
I guarantee it it took a week. His head is down. He's scuffling along. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And yet look at the other person that is in the story. There's the father. And although the Bible doesn't say it, allow me to paint a picture. I imagine the father every day is getting up and he looks outside the house and he's looking across the hills. Maybe today is the day the son will come home. I've heard about his living. I've heard about what all's going on. But he begins to look across the hill. And each day he looks, the father doesn't come home. Our son doesn't come home. But one day he gets up. One day he gets up and he opens the door and he's looking out across the street and he sees something coming in the distance. It's a shape and he wonders, well, I don't expect any guests. There's nobody in the diary that I'm expected. There's no meeting supposed to be happening. Could that really be him? Is that my son coming? And yet he's far enough away, but yet close enough to know that daddy knows that's my boy. That's my son. And the Bible says that while the son is walking to the father and he's still afar off, daddy begins to run towards him. Now you and I, we read that and well, that's lovely. But in the times when Jesus was speaking, the culture was very different. It would have been disrespectful for a father to run to the son. You wouldn't have done that. The son must run to the father. But when Jesus is given the parable, he says, even though the son had gone away from the presence of the Father. Still, the Father comes running to him. I could see his hair is blowing, the cloak behind him, the clothes are slowing him down, so he rips off the coat to get quickly to his son. And so as I heard those words from the Father God saying to me, come home, I began, like the prodigal son, to tear it around in my mind. Well, I wonder why God wants me to come home. I wonder what's going on. I wonder what the motives are. I wonder what this is all about. And God began to call me in the quietness at nighttime. I don't know if you're like me, but I like my sleep. And I I was lying in bed and I knew God was calling me. I know God you've called and you want me to come into the presence, but I'll come and see you about two o'clock in the afternoon when I've got everything done. Can't you meet my schedule? But he kept calling me in the quietness And it was on the 2nd of January this year. 2nd of January, everybody else is in bed. Everyone else is sleeping. And it was 2.30 in the morning. I was fast asleep. And then I woke up. And I heard his voice say to me again, Come home, come home. And so I thought in my head, as I like to do with my logic brain, I'll tell God I'm sorry. I'll work it out. I'll negotiate it. Well, God, you know, I've walked away from you. I'm not as close to you. And if you could take me back, I don't have to be the pastor or whatever you wanted me to be. I'm happy enough just to be in your presence. Just, just take me back like a servant. And I went into the, to the study thinking I would lead the conversation. And so I went into my chair in the study, a nice chair that I have, and I sat down. And in my eyes, I know how this conversation is going to go. I'm going to negotiate with God. And I sit down there and I said, Father, well, do I have to say it again? I called him Daddy. I said, Daddy, I want to come home. And like the prodigal son about to negotiate, I was about to say the next few words. And it only got out of my mouth, Daddy. I want to come home. I didn't have to say any more than that. Then he walked into that room and his presence came so strong that it was even greater than when we felt when the presence of the Lord was so strong here. And it reminded me of this story that the prodigal son made the small walk trudgingly towards the father and the father came running towards him. I made the small sentence that said, Daddy, I want to come home. And he came running in. He didn't wait for me to think, was it the right thing to do? He just needed me to make the small gesture and he came running to me. There is nothing in your life that is too great for you to go back to the Father God. I encourage and I implore you this day, whatever it is that's stopping you from going to him, if nothing is too great, get into the quiet place Sit in the chair, get on your knees, do whatever it is, and call out to Daddy and say, Daddy, I want to come home. Don't let sickness, disease, poverty, worry, anxiety, divorce, separation. The Bible says that nothing can separate us from the love of God. 
God never walked away from me. I was walking away from him. The Bible promises that I will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. And I was wondering then, well, can it ever be the same? Can it ever be the same again? And so I take this, the principle from here. The son says, I'm no longer worthy to be a son, but I'll be a servant. In other words, he was saying, we're going to come back. We're going to have good relationship together, but it will never be the same. Notice what the father, the father didn't say to him, well, you're right, and uh, let's just talk about this, how I'm going to forgive you. The father just ignored what he said. He said, I, you know, I'm not worthy to be a son. I'm going to be a servant. The good, the good uh, response would have been, now I hear what you're saying, and let me tell you how I love you, and let me guide you through this. The father just said, bring out the robe, kill the, the, the fatted calf, let's have a party, let's put on the ring. In other words, what he said, I'm going to honor you even though you don't deserve to be honored. And what God was saying to me, I'm going to use you the way I've always planned to use you. You didn't walk away from your destiny. You haven't messed up. You haven't think. Get back into my presence and let's begin to run the race again. And that is the word of God for you too. Come home to daddy and run the race again. Don't let this year pass away from you. And don't let this church not be the thing it's supposed to be. This is a good church, amen. I'm not just saying that because the pastor's my daddy. If it wasn't a good church, I wouldn't be here. This is the good church. This is the place where the Spirit of the Lord resides. And I believe wholeheartedly that we will know God in a greater way this year. We will see miracles. We will see healings. We will see people born again. We will see our families turned around. We will see those, let me just say it, those in this church who have faced sickness all of their lives and the doctor has written it off. I am convinced this is your year. This is the year that the Lord has made. And I, we heard the prophet, the, pa, the prophet, the pastor, whatever you want to call him, daddy, uh, said at the start of the year, this is the year to, war, to be a warrior. But I don't want to fight in my own strength. I am tired of fighting in my own strength. I am tired of fighting a battle and losing. But when I fight with daddy, not against him, but holding his hand and fight the battle, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. Amen. Let's stop being a victim and be a victor. Let's stop being defeated by the enemy and let's take everything that God has asked us to take. I'm going to repeat the words again. He said to me, and he's saying to you as an individual, and he's saying to us as a church to come home. My sister sent me a song the other day that I can't run away from, and the words are very simple, and it says, there's a place where I belong. There's a place where I belong. There's a place where you belong, and it is called home. You, I am blessed that I grew up with wonderful parents. I am blessed that I can look back in my life and think that home is a wonderful place. I am blessed that I've got a wonderful wife and kids, that I could have an awful day at work, but I know when I get into the house, and I've, I've stopped shouting at the house being a mess, and we've forgiven each other. I know when we get in, I've got a home that's a wonderful place. And for you, you may never have had that luxury. You may hear the word home and associate it with a nightmare. But God's home is a place of beauty. God's home is a place of rest. God's home is a place of strength. And let me urge you today, run home. There is a place where you belong. You don't belong in a foreign country. You don't belong in the pig pen. You don't belong distance away from God. You don't belong at the garden gate. And you don't belong in the garden. You don't belong at the house door. You belong in the living room living right beside the Father God, holding his hand, sitting on his knee every single day. Come home. Two simple words, but they will change your life. My life is being changed by two simple words that he spoke, that he said to come home. Now, I like to give illustrations. I like to give little stories because you may not remember what I say. But when, I, when the daddy was saying this to me, all the verses were coming back about seeking God and seeking Him. And I began to think about seek. And, and when I thought about seek, I don't know about you, I began to think about the game hide and seek. 
I like the game hide and seek. I don't know what's about men. We just never grow up. And so when we were in Poland at Christmas, uh, we're in the house and uh, all Joanna's cousins were there. Uh, and it was about 10 years since the, all of the cousins had been together. And they've grown up. They've now got their own kids. So there's Joanna, uh, f- now from Northern Ireland, uh, speaking English. We've got our Polish cousins. We've got some Polish cousins who now live in Switzerland and they're speaking Italian. Now they're all girls and there's uh, Andrew's bigger. He wants to sit with the parents and hear all the, the good chat, what's going on. doesn't want to play games, but there's Christian. He wanted to play, but he's a fella. They're all girls, a bit nervous what we're going to play. They're playing dolls, don't really want to play dolls. So what will we play? So Christian thinks we'll play hide and seek. Christian speaks English, doesn't speak any Italian that I'm aware of. Uh, he mocks his granny trying to speak Polish. So he doesn't speak Polish. The Polish ones were speaking Polish, don't want to speak English. And other ones were speaking Italian. Well, there's a great thing called Dr. Google. And I watched kids playing hide and seek where they, they typed into Google in Polish, Christian, it's your turn to hide. And then they pressed it and it spoke in English to Christian. And Christian, he's be able to speak English to the Google and speak back Polish. And this was great. And so Christian was loving this game. And I watched him. And first of all, he was asked to be the seeker. So there he is counting. All the girls went to hide and Christian couldn't believe it. We're playing hide and seek and so he goes to find them. Now he looks in the obvious places, under the table, behind daddy, under the Christmas tree. He's searching everywhere, still not finding these people, but he's a quarry and he's smart. And so he decides, I'm watching him and he begins to open the cutlery drawer. Now, son, we need to have a chat. Yes, these are young kids, but I'm not convinced any of them are able to hide in the cutlery drawer. But he knows the game of hide and seek. You're going to hide in a really good place and you can't hide from me. I am going to find you. He is, he is looking in every nook and cranny and he finds them. And he was so happy when he found them. And so his turn became to be the turn to hide. And so he's hiding everywhere. He's hiding under the Christmas trees. He then comes to me and says, Daddy, sit on top of me. Mommy, sit on top of me. They never look under there. And there he is. He's trying to hide. He doesn't want to be found. Now it's a bit, I'll say it anyway, but at one stage he was hiding in the bathroom. The game was going on for half an hour. People forgot he was hiding. Uh, As good parents, we forgot he was hiding as well until one of the ladies went to the toilet. We heard a scream because when she was on the toilet, Christian popped his head out of the shower going, pick a boo. Um, But anyway, he was hiding. (coughs) But I noticed Christian was different. When he was seeking and he found somebody, he was full of joy. But when he was hiding and someone found him, he began to cry. Because the object of the seeker is search and search and search and find. And the object of the hider is make sure you are never found. If you're found, you're rubbish at this game. And I know it's possibly irreverent, but I began to have the thought in my head. And Daddy gave me the vision that me and him were playing hide and seek. And so he said to me, Neil, you, I'm going to hide and you, you seek for me. And so there I was, I was counting to ten. And I was counting, thinking, I wonder where God's going to hide. Man, he's going to be the best at hiding ever. He, he's uh, I'm going to lose this game. And there I was, and I got to ten. And I opened my eyes to go find God. And there he is standing right in front of me. And he goes, God, what are you doing? We're playing hide and seek. You're supposed to hide. And it's like this. If God played hide and seek with us, he would be rubbish at it. Because he wants for us to seek for him, but he also wants us to find him. He doesn't want to hide somewhere where you will never find him. When we read the word, seek for me diligently, it doesn't mean I've hid myself so well that you're going to have to spend eternity trying to find me. God says, I'm standing right beside you. And we spend our lives looking in all of the places trying to find God. I'm trying to find Him in in nature. I'm trying to find Him here. I'm trying to find Him there. When God's saying already, don't I live inside you? Peace and be still. Just sit down and be quiet and start looking over there and look here. Just look in your heart. That's where I live. Daddy is with us. Now I need to get to the end of this. I heard this as I've been seeking God and seeking Him for the last while. I read this little um, 
I don't know what you want to call it, a little, little line or a little verse that somebody had written. And it said this, that God puts a longing inside our heart for love because it will always lead us back to him. I don't care who you are. You are always looking for love in your life. You try and find a lovely woman. You try to lovely, find a man. You try to love your kids. You love your job. You love whatever. We're always searching for love. And it's good to have a wife. It's good to have a husband. It's good to be in love and all of those things. But he put a longing inside us for love. And if you read the Bible in 1 John, it tells us that God is love. Not that God gives love, which he does. Not that God shows love, and he does. But the Bible declares that God is love. When God put a longing inside of you for love, in other words, it says, God put a longing inside of you for him. And inside of my heart, I could see that there's a river inside of me, like there's a river inside of you. And I had allowed that river to become still. I allowed that river to be still. And I could see in my mind's eye that the Father God just took his finger and he put it into the water and he began to stir the water again. He began to stir the longing inside of my heart for love. He began to stir the longing in my heart for him. He always longs for me. He never lays me nor forsakes me. But he says, Neil, it's time to draw you again. And I will encourage you as well that that's what the Lord is doing with you as a person and us as a church, that he's reached his finger down inside our hearts and he's stirring the waters within you. And he says, I'm stirring up that longing that's within inside your heart. Come home and come back to me. I want to say one thing and then we'll close this morning. King David, at this point in time, he's the shepherd boy, just David. And he's living on the fields. He's looking after the sheep. And we know then that, uh, that Samuel's the prophet. He's going to come down to the house of Jesse. And he says, I want you to go to that house because there I've anointed someone to be king. And you're going to go down and speak into their lives and anoint them. And David is on the hills. And Samuel comes down and he comes to the first boy and he says, well, you're tall, you're strong, you're a good looking fella. Surely you would... And he goes down the entire line, and not one of them is selected to be king. And Samuel says to Jesse, is there any other boys? Well, there's David, and he's, but he's just out with the sheep. He's just out there, and that's a waste of your time. But he's brought back in, and the minute Samuel sees him, he says, this is the one, this is the one that was anointed to be king. And I know how we hear that story. We hear it heard all, and preached all the times that God doesn't look on the outward man. But God looks at the heart, and that is right, and that is correct. But this week, God talked me through that story in a different way. And I began to look at David as a shepherd boy on the hills. And even though he was on the fields, he was still doing good things. It was a good thing to protect the sheep. But have a look what else David did. He killed a lion, and he killed a bear. I don't know about you, but you could read past that and think nothing about it. That's pretty impressive to kill. I don't know about you, but if a lion is going to come in here, I'm going to lift Robbie and say, Robbie, deal with that as I'm hiding in there. I am not going to go and try and tackle a lion. I'm not going to go and tackle a bear. But David, he still killed a lion and a bear. I'm not even convinced if a little cat walked in here with his claws and meowed at me, I'd probably hide in there as well. So David was still doing impressive things. Looking after the sheep was a good thing to do. Killing a lion and a bear, it was impressive. He was still doing good things as a shepherd boy on the hill. But even though he was doing good things, God had something even greater for him. He was called to be a giant slayer and he was called to be a king. He was called to live in a palace, in a field doing great things called to be in a palace and do all unbelievable things that he would never imagine he would do. But David needed to go somewhere first in order to leave the field and to go to the palace. He needed to make one journey and that journey was to the father's house. When he walked into the father's house, the word was spoken over his life and he was anointed. If he never went to the father's house, he would never have heard, he would not have been anointed, and he would not have been king. 
And you today could be doing good things. You today could be laying hands on the sick and see them recover. You today could be preaching the gospel and seeing many one to Jesus. It doesn't matter how good things you are doing right today. God has even greater plans for your life. And in order to you to go from the place where you're doing well and go to the place that is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ever ask or think, in order to go from that place to there, you first need to go to Daddy's house and be anointed. God is welcoming us back into His presence, not just so that we are close to Him, but that He would anoint us afresh to take us from this place and bring us to a place of anointing and abundance. And it all begins simply with this, with two words, to come home. Amen, amen. Let's just go to pray of your word. Father, I just thank you for your, your word this, this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you've spoke to my heart. I thank you, Father God, that when you've spoken to me, you've also had this church in mind as well. And so, Lord, we come to you this morning afresh And Lord, we say to you as each and every person, Daddy, we come home. We come home into your presence. We come closer to you than never before. You never left us. You're not trying to get closer to us. You never walked away, but we're walking closer to you. Daddy, we're coming home. All right. If he was preaching on healing... If he's preaching on healing, we'd have a prayer line for healing. If he's preaching on the demonic, we would have a prayer line to have you delivered. What a word. What a word. The intimacy of God talking to you this morning, stirring you. Some of you haven't been stirred for a long, long time. Some of you forget what it's like even to be stirred. And it's not that you're backslid. It's not that you're a wine-bibber now. It's just you're not at that place he was talking about. And thank you, Neil, for being so honest. You don't often get preachers just as open uh, open their soul so far back as you did just to let you see, hey, I'm real like everybody else. But I think he hit it. I think he hit the point. He hit the point. That daddy's calling. Daddy's calling. When daddy calls, it calls for a response. It calls for a response. We can't just say amen and walk out that door without making some type of response saying daddy that's me I am desperate now I'm not happy where I am I'm getting along and I'm getting through and and everybody looks at me and thinks I'm the bee's knees but I'm not happy and I'm not through and you just say God I, I want that intimacy that that man's talking about I don't have it to give this guy on the front doesn't have it to give but daddy does so if you're ready for to be stirred in response to God, why don't you step up with, with Pastor Laura this morning? That's a brave woman. Shot out there. I thought you were coming after me. If you need to stand where she's standing and say, God, I just need more. Get up the front. Get, this won't take long. You're about to hear in a second of time. I, I, as usual, I won't ask you a simple thing. It's none of my business absolutely none of my business. We won't talk to you about these things. Why should we? This is, this is nothing to do with me. And this is, this is Daddy. This is Daddy talking to us. Daddy's talking to us. Spirit of the living God, I don't think there's one of us in this meeting this morning's at that place probably.